Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome in this Euro webinar of European School of Urology. For today, we have selected for you a very hot topic in urology, which is artificial intelligence. We will begin with the basics of artificial intelligence, delve into the vast possibilities and current applications, as well as ethical cons considerations in the field of urology. Welcome in this very interesting webinar. We have done very, uh, very uh, well-known experts here. We will start with Peter De Becker. He's a graduated engineer who subsequently started medical training and urology residency is very rare. Peter leads the Orsi Academy, Inotech department, where the engineers build surgical AI systems for skill assessment. And he's also finishing his PhD on the same topic. He will talk today about the ABC of artificial intelligence in urology, a practical guide for the modern urologist, just to make it then clear for everybody at the beginning of this webinar, what is, the, what is artificial intelligence? What are the terms? Make it clear, and then this will help you to understand the other talks, and then you will enjoy it, I'm sure. Welcome in this webinar. Peter, stage is yours. Thank you very, very much, Professor Gözen. Um, so if all goes well, you should be able to see my screen and then I'm happy to go ahead. So um, as uh, kindly introduced, I'll talk about uh, artificial intelligence and what it can mean for the modern urologists. Um, so I have non, no relevant disclosures. So as urologists, we talk a lot about sexual function or sexual dysfunction. And as such, I would like to start with this quote about teenage sex. Everyone speaks about it. AI is like teenage sex and everyone speaks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it, so everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, and they claim that they are doing it. And so I'd like to start this way because I believe that today we start, we should do the same thing, and we should uh, make sure that everybody understands the basic, uh, like Professor Goethe said. So if we look at urology, there are basically two things that we have. We have, first of all, surgery and computer vision. And second of all, we have our outpatient clinic in which we do a lot of talking and a lot of typing in which we need a patient in which we need the um, natural language processing. So the first part of the talk is about uh, computer vision. So if we look at computer vision, what is it today in surgery? Basically, we can track instruments using AI. We can see which instrument is moving when, if it's doing co like coagulation, when the endoscope is moving. We can see where the instruments are. We can give them separate colors. And this is like the basics for surgical AI in computer vision. But what we can also do, and this is work that we perform at, at uh, Orsi Academy, we train surgeons. And one of, the tr one of the errors that you can make as a surgeon whilst uh, learning how to perform robotics is getting, going with your needle out of sight. And this is what you see here. You, you see the system which automatically detects when the needle is out of view so it can help you in improving your practice. So even further, you can also uh, automatically uh, help in performing um, uh, automated surgery or automated assistance. And this is a system that tracks the instrument, sees where the bleeding is coming from, and the suction then fully automatically detects and helps to control the suction. So if we look at artificial intelligence, there are two main subdomains and this is what i really would like you to to gather here is uh, you have artificial intelligence and then there's machine learning as a subdiscipline and even more specific is deep learning and deep learning is very recent machine learning is a bit less recent and the way they were able to flourish is because of increased computation uh, power as well as increased data so looking at artificial intelligence, I'll first go through all of three cases by explaining the following example. We try to detect a surgical instrument, so a robotic instrument. So suppose we want to detect this uh, monopolar curved scissors. In artificial intelligence, like it has been done for 50 years, we would, could, could say, look, if 10% of the pixels are orange, then this is a monopolar curved scissors. So you basically hard code it, simple rule. And then what happens, you see an image like this, which has the, the tip cover and it suddenly there is no orange. So there is no real learning. The system is intelligent, but not really. And there is no real world data generalization. So we need something better. And this is machine learning. In machine learning, there is learning and we give the system a lot more information than pure hard-coded rules. And we think about it as engineers, as humans, as urologists, 
how can we detect a scissor? May we should do something which is called feature engineering. And first, what we could do is turn these images into lines. And then we say, OK, a scissors has a triangle, like you see here, and like you see here, or like you see here. Maybe we should detect the number of triangles. Subsequently, the number of orange. So because this has orange here, here is for the Maryland, it has triangles and some orange inside. And then thirdly, if we do not have these instruments, we have instruments with a lot of metal and a lot of black. So maybe this is the good way. But what are these thresholds? Maybe there is a triangle here as well. So what are these? How should we define it? This is where the learning happens. So this is you give the system thousands and thousands and thousands of images. And you let the system determine what is exactly the threshold to discern between which percentage of orange, which ratio of black metal. And the system is really becoming intelligent. So in deep learning, things go a bit further and the algorithm learns by itself. You do not do any feature engineering. You do not tell it how you want to learn it. But you need massive amounts of data, more than machine learning. You need data representative for your problem. And you, in this way, you do not impose rules. So maybe the system can learn things that the human did not even think of. And so how does this training work? Suppose we want to make this, this type of system. What we, then give the, we, what we then give to this algorithm is we give it images and delineations of the instruments. And we push this through this algorithm, which is basically a type of decision tree with subsequent connections. And we make a first prediction, which is very bad. And then we say this prediction is bad. We send it back to the system and we adapt all of these weights here that um, make the prediction. And we try again and we see that, the, that, it, that it improves. And we try again, we adapt the weights and we try again. And we go back, we again adapt the weights and we try again and we end up where we should be, as you can see here. So this is the training. So how does the system look like once it's trained? Well, basically what, what you see in these systems, you did not say what it should be, uh, how it should de derive which instrument it is, but you see that in the basic layers, for instance, it learns to detect edges. In the subsequent layers, there are higher features, higher um, nuances like uh, the tips or like the type of hinge. And then further down, it becomes really complex and you see that it starts to detect the type of graph the type of grasper, <clears throat> the type of scissors, and it makes a prediction. So if you input this image, first, this type of neuron, it's called a neuron because it looks like a lot of connections between each other is activated with the, the, this, these lines. You, the ridges you have here, this type of connection is present. And then after that, you also see here that this is very much activated because you have this type of forceps and it's a cadier and it's not a progress with less frequency, less plausibility fenestrated by polar and definitely not a scissor. Okay, so why, do, why are these, these things called neural networks? Because basically they work like our brain. First in our eyes, we get the basic uh, visual information. In our primary cortex of our brain, we get primitive shapes. And then in our secondary cortex, we get abstract thinking and we decide on what we are actually seeing. So this is one thing, but does this only work on video? Of course not. It works on radiology, what, what, uh, the, what uh, the Professor Ahmed will talk about. For instance, in um, CT scans, you can automatically detect 3D models, which is another interesting topic. Or you could classify the kidney lesion as renal cell carcinoma or angiomyolipoma. For text, which Professor Chachamani will talk about, you can do also a lot of interesting things. But I will now give the short technical introduction to text so that he can easily elaborate on this. So looking at text and going to our outpatient clinic, we see that natural language processing is basically a mixture of what I said before. It's it has AI, natural language processing has AI inside, it has machine learning inside, it has some deep learning inside. And the whole goal of NLP, natural language processing, is to understand text and speech like humans. And this is used in Google Translate, it can extract information, the chatbot, the chatbots you see on different websites, all of it uses natural language processing. Okay, so we know what natural language processing is. 
Well, how can it help us? Well, it can help us if you have to do a retrospective data collection and you need to go into all these uh, patient discharge forms and you need to look for x-rays and blood tests and whatnot. It takes a lot of time. And nobody really likes to do this after a long day of surgery or a long day of, of clinics. So this is where AI or where this natural language processing can help. It takes in this unstructured data that you see here. And this study, what they did is they compared what happens if you have clinicians extracting all the data like here and doing a clinical uh, clinical study. So a hypothesis on, uh, on lung cancer in this case. And they checked what happens if you do not do it like this and you have an NLP, mo uh, NLP model extracting it for you. And basically the real world, world data was exactly the same. So this works, this helps. So NLP is a spectrum. You can do it rule-based, you can do it machine learning based, you can do it with the large language models. Large language models, these are the, the chat GPTs. So what they have is they are very performant, they generalize very well, but they require a lot of data and you don't have control or interpretability. Maybe you've read, you've heard about how a chat, chat GPT or an LLM large language model can be racist. Well, this is because it, you do not have control or you can difficultly interpret it. So if we look at ChatGPT as my final comment, you see that it's trained on 45 terabytes. And if you put all books of 45 terabytes, you get a bookshelf of 9,000 kilometers. And how does it learn to write? Basically, you give it an input. For this, this case, I use the first sentence of this manuscript. And you say, OK, I will remove parts of the input. But you know what the full sentence is. Then the system makes a prediction of what it thinks should be there. And then you check what the real output was. So this is the sentence that was in this manuscript. And then you see that it correctly, correctly predicts language, correctly predicts being used rather than being applied, but it gets this word wrong. And then you say, OK, please correct it. And it goes through the cycle of repetition and self-learning. So I hope this was a bit, this clarifies a bit the whole aspect of AI. And it tells you that we should not be afraid of things we do not understand. So if you look at AI as the Terminator, we should probably have a look at him as Arnold Schwarzenegger and get acquainted because AI is an opportunity and not a threat. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Really nice talk. We get an overview. What is what? How much data is inside? Now we know a little bit about what we are dealing with if we, if we are talking then about a, a artificial intelligence. Now, thank you very much. Now I want to introduce then my co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Giovanni Cacciamani. You know all of them. It's an expert in artificial intelligence. He's an associate professor of urology and radiology. Was also serving as a co-director of the Artificial Intelligence Center at the University of Southern California, and he is the chair of the Young Academic Urologist Working Group in Eurotechnology. Now he will give us an, a talk about ChatGPT. Everybody is using it; we know it, but about the practical applications for reasonable academic and clinical use. Can we use it for clinical studies, George Giovanni? The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Gozen. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, here is a, a very sunny day here in California, and uh, it is my pleasure uh, to talk to you about the uh, possibilities that we have on healthcare in the use of GPTs and large language models application as ChatGPT in healthcare in urology. Enough conflict of interest. So, uh, you know, as uh, Peter was mentioning, AI is uh, a discipline. And when we are going through uh, the machine learning, we have to consider that machine learning is a subfield of the artificial intelligence. One of the things that we have to consider is that AI is the theory and dependent on computer systems that are able to uh, perform tasks normally requiring the human language. Uh, on the other side, machine learning gives computers the ability to learn without explicit programming. So, just to give you an idea, there are two uh, main uh, um, main ways that uh, machine learning is using. One is a supervised learning, the other one is unsupervised. In the supervised learning, we have the input data and the model um, uh, evaluate and analyze the data and give the prediction. And in case you have an error, then you have an iteration through the model in order to refine or fine tune in the model. In the unsupervised learning, you have the input data, the data are going to feed in the model and the model generate examples. So why we are talking about this? Because 
within the machine learning, we have a subset, a subset that of machine learning, which is deep learning. And deep learning uses artificial intelligence and neural networking, allowing them to process more complex patterns than traditional machine learning. And through these, and this is something that we have to consider, we have two different learning models that are usually are used. One is to discriminate something. So it is used to classify or to predict, like a prediction model. On the other side, and this, of course, typically uh, trained on data set with labeled data and learns the relationship between features and the data points <clears throat> and the labels. In the generative deep learning, and this is something that we're going to talk about now, um, this is generate new data that are similar to the data that are trained on. And this is something totally unique when it's compared to discriminative pat patterns. So let's go back and try to understand a little bit better. So here you can see a flowchart that is telling you how a predictive machine learning works. So you have data, you have labels, those data that are labeled are basically uh, input into the machine learning, which learns the relationship between the data and the labels and the house as an output is gonna give you the label of that particular data. So in other words, you have a discriminative technique. You have, for example, a picture, you ask to the machine learning to classify this picture and the discriminative model is telling you that that picture is picturing, for example, a dog. Let's check the generative AI model. In the generative AI model, you have an unstructured content you have to input this unstructured content into the generative AI model, which learns patterns in unstructured contents. And then as an output is giving you a new content, which actually is totally unique. And this is what generative techniques generate. So you basically have in your mind the picture of a dog and you ask to the system to generate through a generative model, a new picture. And the system will generate for you a new picture of a dog. So the main differences between the, these two components are the classification and the generation. So why we're talking about this? Because in terms of generative models, we have generative models that are generative language models and generative image models. In the generative language models, those are basically, uh, you give them some text and they, they predict what that could potentially come next. And in the image, uh, generative image model, uh, you give a prompt uh, or a related imaginary, and they transform the random noise into images or generate imaging from prompt. So why we're talking about this? Because this is the foundation of the generative AI, uh, the GPTs and large language models. As you can see, you can give an input as a text. As an output, you can have a text that can be a translation, summarization, or an, or, or an image. You can ask to the system to generate an image or a video. You can ask the system to generate an audio or uh, making some decision. <clears throat> on the other side, you can have an input that could potentially be an image, and the system automatically convert that image into a text, like an image captation, a visual question answering, uh, an output of a new image that can have a super resolution or completing the image, and as a video, making the animation. Uh, so, and this is basically how the generative, uh, the generative pre-training transforming model, like GPT, is actually are working. So. One of the things that we have to consider is that in uh, on uh, December uh, 2022, um, the generative uh, AI became uh, mainstream. It became uh, more, uh, um, you know, flexible and uh, on uh, on the public, becoming something that actually, uh, you know, um, rise the wow effect of the uh, generative, the artificial intelligence. But what we have to consider is that generative AI, even though you know. Big Gates says that AI, like ChatGPT, will be the most important innovation revolution after internet and after uh, um, you know the World Wide Web. And you know, of course, became mainstream in the uh, New York Post, uh, New Yorker, etc. What we have to consider is that generative AI is not that uh, new. What is new is the model size, and here you can see basically the numbers. Uh, what uh, changed from 2019 to is of course the type of model used, but also the model size in billions of parameters. And as you can see, you can have in the very first uh, model that was uh, proposed in 2019 with zero point billions of parameters and coming to basically now in 2023 with MedPalm that has 540 billions of parameters that are gonna be used. So how we can use this kind of technology in our daily practice? Well, there are several uh, new uh, concepts that can be uh, evaluated again. Remember that those are still right now concepts because uh, is not uh, uh, clearly uh, HIPAA compliant and uh, is something that we are working on. 
So clinical copiloting, what means clinical copiloting? You can use this kind of technology trained, for example, in a multimodal self-supervised training with text and audio uh, in order to um, feed in with images, um, the electronic medical records, signalis, omics, uh, like radiomics, patomics, genomics, and graphics. And through the medical domain knowledge, uh, actually is going to give you a co-pilot of uh, your, our decision-making process as a physician. And the application are endless. It can be used for chatbots for patients, interactive note-taking, augmented procedures, together with text to protein generation and best side decision process. And also, for example, in the wearable for uh, um, uh, following other patients during the uh, post-operative course. This is one of the uh, one of the examples. You can, in the best side decision, um, the system can be fed with the EMR, uh, the audio, the text from the patients. Uh, the system can advise the doctor that insulin is required. And the, to, the, to the question, the doctor, okay, why? Because we have to correct hyperkalemia. Um, another quest, another thing that could potentially be done, and this is extremely unique uh, of this kind of procedures, is that it can uh, co-pilot the radiologist in the, the decision and in the evaluation of the medical images. Very recently has been released uh, uh, this new uh, type of uh, um, machine learning model, MedPart 2, that actually is uh, uh, giving you the chance to analyze automatically an X-ray and giving you basically the main uh, summary of the findings and the impression in a very standardized way. Uh, another example is augmented procedures. So through a real-time procedure, the systems like large range models or generative AI that are going to be trained properly, <clears throat> they will basically advise you uh, where basically a potential um, uh, intraoperative adverse event could potentially happen. Other example of GPTs and large language models is streaming the clinical the, the, uh, daily task. We know that as physicians, we are always uh, surrounded by a lot of things to do and uh, the burnout is always around the corner. It has been released uh, a report from uh, the US uh, um, AMA that says that almost 65% of physicians in the US is in burnout and 56% of residents, which actually has not even started with what is gonna be the real clinical um, uh, clinical life uh, alone, at least, um, are going to be in burnout. And the main reason of burnout is because we are uh, a lot. We have a lot of things to do. So how actually GPTs and large models can help us? So uh, as it's been released, this is a new report from uh, Peter Lee and colleagues uh, in uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine that basically says that actually there are several of the um, possibilities that can be used. One of the most time-consuming tasks that we have to do on a daily basis is are the clinical notes. So imagine to have your clinical uh, evaluation of the patient, a microphone is uh, recording what you say, and then is basically um, translating all the recording and the script into a structured um, e electronic medical records. That is gonna be unique. That is gonna uh, in increase the standardization of uh, uh, the most important is gonna save time. And this is just an example. You can basically have a recording of your uh, uh, patient um, of your patient uh, encounter, as you can see, clinician, patient, clinician, patient. And then you can ask to the GPT-4 to summarize in the entire patient encounter in a clinical note. This, of course, translates into reducing our workload, but also we can ask to the system to uh, make a summary in a layperson uh, language in order to improve the knowledge and uh, of, uh, of our patients. Uh, another example, as Peter was uh, showing, is uh, an automated, basically, data extraction. As you can see here, uh, this is just an example of uh, a mock-up scenario of a, uh, a radiological report through a prompt that we are working on. And using this, of course, is using uh, ChatGPT, but we are using GPT-4. Actually, uh, through a prompt, uh, um, the system is able to go through the entire uh, radiological node and extracting automatically all the important information in less than 14 seconds in a table that is going to be standardized and that is going to be um, you know, very easy to understand. And most importantly, if you extend this into patients and patient data, this could potentially uh, create a database in a matter of hours. Patient education. We know that patient education is extremely important. In the majority of the cases, unfortunately, uh, the uh, Dr. Google is the first consultation, and sometimes uh, we are just uh, the second opinion. And we know that the pernicious trap of the fake news is always around the corner. We uh, demonstrated that in, uh, in the past. So uh, over the past uh, a few months, our team has worked on uh, 
uh, to evaluate how ChatGPT actually is able to uh, give uh, in a correct uh, and uh, uh, complete information, uh, medical information. What we found, <clears throat> looking at this, we, we found that actually, yes, it's accurate, but uh, is not uh, that complete. Uh, sometimes uh, for malignant treatment or emergency, actually the system is not telling you to go to the doctor, which actually could potentially increase uh, um, the uh, burden, the potential drawbacks to the patients. Another important information is how <clears throat> we can vehicle the information to the patients. We found that clinical patient summaries uh, uh, in the uh, urological literature are not fitting the purpose. Uh, so therefore, our team work on putting together uh, GPT-4 model, and we will have <clears throat> a new uh, website that will be released very soon, where uh, you can literally copy and paste the abstracts of uh, you know your research or whatever, and it's going to make uh, a summary that can be uh, given to the patient for increasing their uh, um, uh, their uh, uh, understanding of their condition or uh, uh, the possible treatment. Uh, and this is actually how urologists actually are thinking of uh, GPTs and how they could potentially be used. We released uh, a very recently a, uh, um, a survey, and here you can see some of the results of this survey that says that uh, these uh, GPTs and larger language models could potentially be used for potential clinical tasks and the potential academic tasks. Urologists also uh, are aware that um, this kind of technology could potentially um, increase the inaccuracy responses, the lack of specific responses, the variability. There can be potential bias in the responses. And most difficult, and most importantly, we have to understand that patients could potentially have difficulties in interpreting how those responses are. Um, so um, just concluding, uh, GPTs and large language models, of course, can be used not only for clinical practice, for streaming line, but also for academia and scientific writing. But also what we have to consider is that, and here you can see uh, very two very recent publications in the Nature uh, uh, family, the imperative need of regulatory oversight, and also how chatbots uh, needs the approval as medical devices. We have to do a step back and to uh, make sure that what we're going to do is uh, um, uh, ethical and accountable research. The risk is that uh, we could potentially have in the future publications and academia that is going just based on this kind of technology, reducing basically the humanization of what is the research, how is the hypothesis generation. And uh, we need to use these technologies as a slave and or a co-pilot uh, at the very, you know, at the very last, but not as a colleague that we can use and we can ask basically for information. Uh, so to this end, we think that we is not just a matter of academia writing, academic writing, but academia and scientific writing. So uh, to this end, I'm going just a little bit, um, you know, faster. We need to understand that GPT actually cannot be used, for example, as one of the author. And uh, looking at the number of publications that in screen is increasing just in the last month of 79 publications, uh, uh, there is an imperative need where science, ethics, and society are going to bring them all together in order to make uh, the uh, real change and making some new guidance. So uh, we know that COPE actually released a statement uh, that says that basically ChatGPT or the large language model should never be uh, listed as one of the authors. But on top of this, our team is working on a new type of uh, um, uh, guidelines that we will be released in a couple of months, and the name is Kangaroo. So again, uh, the, name, the main reason is that we want to identify potential risk, potential risk and benefit, ethical concerns, the form of disclosure, and how to report this kind of system technology. Uh, we know that several publishers, regulatory committees, journals, and academic association actually are, you know, uh, releasing those uh, uh, kind of uh, um, guidelines. But this, of course, is bringing uh, a, a bubble tower effect where different parties are talking different languages, reducing basically the uh, reproducibility in the entire uh, scientific academia. So therefore, we are proposing this new uh, type of uh, uh, guidelines that will be released in a, a couple of months from now. And the name is Kangaroo. So, ChatGPT, Generative Artificial Intelligence, and Natural Large Language Models, Accountable Reporting and Use of Guidelines. And all of you that are in this webinar will be more than welcome of being part of the uh, future Delphi consensus. Um, this will provide a list of don'ts, uh, provide guidance on how to disclose it, provide a reporting checklist where uh, used, uh, where these could potentially be used as the intervention. And this is the uh, flowchart that we're going to use. So as you can see, you know, we perform different systematic reviews, bibliometric, courting members, 
etc. Uh, so the main and just to conclude, the main reason is that we are going to propose those guidelines are basically to protect uh, the academic field and the scientific writing output. Uh, we are going to uh, measure the ethical accountability for future reproducibility of these studies, and this will be basically cross disciplines cross academia. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you all, and uh, if uh, uh, some of you want to uh, join the team, uh, we just released this community, EuroGPT Hub. Uh, you can uh, uh, join us, uh, you can shoot me an email, and we'll be more than happy to have you on board. Thank you so much for your attention. you you can go with this second yes so if there are no questions um uh, i will go <clears throat> okay um ali we are going to do the questions at the end or uh, uh after each we, will, uh... we, will, we get already some questions uh, in the box geo we will give them answers thereafter at the end of the uh, of the webinar we will get some or we will answer the questions we we will found them in the box okay wonderful Okay, uh, so thank you so much, Ali. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, introduce you all the next speaker, uh, Professor Kamran Hamed. He is a professor of urology in Consulta Urological Surgeons. He's affiliated with the King's College of London, Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, and Sheikh Khalifa Medical uh, uh, City in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he will uh, talk about uh, the AI in acid image diagnostics in urology, oncological and non oncological condition. Kamran, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Gio, for that uh, kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, I'll just uh, start my talk uh, without any delay. So, okay. Uh, all right. So, slides on. And um, okay. So, um, uh, welcome to this webinar. And um, uh, my topic is um, around uh, uh, enhanced imaging in oncological and non oncological conditions. And um, so uh, I'll start straight away with the AI is, um, uh, is there to extract information um, from uh, physiological and pathological data to achieve uh, clinical and meaningful points. So that's what AI is so far, uh, most of the understanding is about, and that's the aim uh, for, for the utility of the AI. So my talk uh, will focus on the science of AI-based uh, imaging diagnosis that will be further expanded to uh, prostate and renal cancers and urolithiasis. It's just um, about it, these topics for, for the sake of time. And um, in um, uh, 2022, uh, Time Magazine um, acknowledged AI to be uh, uh, one of the best um, uh, innovations. And it is changing um, uh, the medical imaging uh, with the aim to detect uh, problems um, uh, earlier, uh, tracking uh, patients um, uh, thoroughly, and uh, spotting abnormalities that may get missed um, uh, by the uh, human interpretation. So uh, for FDA, um, I, mean, I mean, FDA to approve an algorithm, um, uh, it involves um, uh, 80 to 90 percent of um, accuracy so that uh, they can uh, roll it out for um, uh, clinical uh, utility. So, uh, so the main regulator at the moment seems to be uh, FDA for uh, these uh, algorithms. And uh, however, FDA makes it clear that humans have to be the final authority for the machine learning algorithms. So recently, uh, there have been a series of approvals by uh, FDA, and there are about um, 178 AI and machine learning devices that were added to the list. Um, uh, and the radiology, as you can see over here, contributes to about 75% of all these approvals over the past um, uh, few decades. And urology, I'd just like to highlight here, or because we're most of urologists, that is only 1% uh, of um, all of these approvals. So I think as urologists, we have to work hard further. So, uh, and how does um, the AI-based um, diagnostic imaging work? So in order to understand that, um, uh, I would like to um, define these two uh, terms in context of um, uh, radiology. One is uh, radiomics, uh, which is um, extraction of higher number of uh, quantitative features from the medical imaging. And the artificial intelligence in context of radiology is, um, on the other hand, um, uh, is a set of um, um, uh, 
uh, computational um, algorithms that can um, accurately perform a prediction for uh, the decision sport. So um, here you can see in this diagram just down below, uh, it shows uh, how the raw scanner data uh, could be added to uh, the other parameters, such as uh, radiology report, pathological report and uh, pathology report, and that is like a histology, and then the treatment plan and the outcome. This in turn improves the accuracy of the entire algorithms. And this is my other uh, co-speakers talk about earlier, specifically about the machine learning and the deep learning. So uh, this process, I mean, the good thing about this process is it's not a static process. So the, in, in the data input into AI algorithm is a dynamic process. It conflict constantly evolves. It accepts the data that's good and rejects the data that's not good. And the process just go back from the end to the beginning to understand. And so that it's an evolving thing and constantly evolving. This is what the concept of um, uh, deep learning that was um, um, uh, explained earlier by my first speaker, uh, Peter. And um, so now I'm moving on to the prostate and uh, prostate cancer is uh, one of the most commonly evaluated uh, urology condition with the potential to uh, localize lesions on the MRI or other scans and it helps with the workflow for the patient treatment. So um, uh, you may see here in this table that um, uh, there are a number of algorithms that recently over the past two to three years that have been approved by uh, FDAs and images are acquired, they are picked up and uh, they are inserted into machine learning models to make sense out of it. So uh, here I'm giving you an example of a 67 year old um, uh, patient uh, with a PSA of around six. And here MRI shows uh, there is a lesion on the right peripheral side of the gland and the deep learning um, uh, mapping further. So this, this lesion, it, sorry, it's, this lesion shows, as you can see, I mean, I'm sure uh, some people can uh, just like evaluate it. It's just like, it's kind of equivocal lesion on the diffusion weighted uh, and diffusion restriction, mild diffusion restrictions there. But when it's put in into uh, the deep learning softwares, so the mapping recommends the biopsy. And the biopsy when on this patient was carried out, it showed three plus four, uh, Gleason, um, Gleason three plus four prostate cancer. So here's an example that um, when any kind of lesion that's equivocal, and um, uh, but this information based on the PSA, patients, other factors, family history, and all other information that the system learns is put into the system. It, it, it just shows us recommendations. And then that's, that's why this biopsy was performed to uh, come to this diagnosis. So uh, another example here, further to that, this, uh, I mean, the patient, um, so what here we can see that uh, moving from MRI only um, uh, uh, practice to uh, seek AI um, uh, help for, seek AI's help for the entire patient journey. So AI also here identifies pathologies and uh, performs the risk evaluation. Uh, as you can see from different data entries, it is an automated system that uh, takes the data, synthesizes the data, and performs some predictions. So here's an example. Further to that, the management is also recommended uh, by the AI uh, learning software using the concept of deep, deep learning, and uh, predictions are made for success and the failure of the treatment. I'm showing a video here of one of the FDA approved uh, uh, algorithm, and you can see uh, when information such as MRI images when a PSA, patient's history, patient's family history, and other parameters are put into the system, the recommendations are made. It evaluates, the system evaluates on its own, the pirate scoring. It identifies those images, put those images on a, on a paper sheet or a data sheet, electronic sheet. And these all this information, predictions, and the outcomes are discussed. And it can be discussed in the MDT to make sense out of it. So you can see here, the AI has been developed, the algorithms have been developed in addition to the software they've been put in and these all these can be utilized uh, from for the entire patient journey starting from the presentation to the treatment and treatment outcomes and the follow-up so uh, 
Next thing is uh, I'm moving on to uh, the renal cancer here. So renal cancer, uh, again, AI-based softwares are there to help um, with the uh, evaluation or disting distinguishing between the benign and the malignant conditions. And also it can distinguish across the different types of uh, cancers that I'll explain in the next uh, couple of slides. And uh, also establishes, there's also got ability to establish um, uh, the correlation between the genomics profile and kidney cancers and the pathological data, which is extremely important in case of the renal cancers. So here, you can see previously in the in the prostate uh, section, you can see that we discuss about the MRI. Here, the examples are the CT-based enhanced images and that have been put into data algorithm. And you can see the ability of the AI uh, um, uh, uh, algorithms to determine the different types of uh, tumors with a high grade of accuracy. And uh, then when, again, a multi-modality such as CT or MRI are used, that further enhances the accuracy of um, uh, the uh, diagnosis and also enhances the prediction of um, any kind of um, uh, outcomes. So there are... Um, uh, then moving on to the urolithiasis. Urolithiasis is, um, I would say, uh, is uh, one of the areas uh, that have been um, uh, uh, studied a lot um, uh, for the management of stones. And what we can do here with the urolithiasis, I mean, you can we can um, uh, actually uh, predict uh, the success of the spontaneous passage of the uh, stones. I mean, that's really important, specifically the patients presenting into emergency. When we look at the images, um, and we can just like based on the presence of the stone, location of the stone, type of the stone, shape of the stone. There's so many factors that are actually determinant, determine uh, the uh, ability for the spontaneous passage. And then it can differentiate between uh, stones and the flabolites. Again, we come across these are, this is an issue when interpreting the uh, CT scan. So that's um, yeah, that's got successful ability to do that. And also we can identify the uh, uh, type of the stones in there and also the prediction of the uh, clearance of the stones. So here you can see, I mean, uh, the uh, automation or the information that can be put in into the uh, AI-based uh, software is not only the image, but also images combined with the uh, clinical um, uh, radiomics and then uh, genomics uh, are put into the system as well in order to uh, predict um, the presence, location, spontaneous passage of the stone and the clearance of the stone. Also, the ability uh, of the recurrence of the stones, which is an area that's still not been uh, studied fully. So uh, as another model where only radiomics are used, not the radiogenomics are used, so that again can uh, give an uh, accurate uh, information about the type of stone. But as I said earlier, the multimodality uh, 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 use, uh, multimodality uh, imaging, uh, when it's put in into the softwares along with the other information, then the precision uh, increases basically. And then uh, in, this is an interesting um, uh, overview of the literature that has been done that demonstrate that um, uh, various studies uh, with the use of AI and machine learning based uh, 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 systems. So they can show that the, the, the ability of the AI software to detect the stone is up to, the detected type of the stones is up to 90%. And then uh, also they can determine the spontaneous passage of the stone and the accuracy is more than 85% according to uh, some of these studies. And then um, the other important thing is um, uh, the, uh, ability of the stone clearance, uh, specifically after uh, PCNL or um, uh, uh, extra shockwave lithotripsy. I mean, uh, if we can predict uh, prior to starting this procedure, I think that that can be really helpful. And the studies have shown that the AI-based software have got ability to detect it up to 90 to 95 percent, uh, which in my opinion is amazing. And um, uh, finally, I would uh, just conclude my uh, talk over here by saying that AI is here to stay. We should educate ourselves about it and accept this change. There are a number of um, uh, given advantages um, of the AI and that we are able to understand. Also during this webinar, we were trying our best to highlight it in a simple way. But uh, we also still need to uh, standardize um, uh, the uh, presence or the presence of the data. So for the proper analysis, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Carmen, uh, for uh, your excellent presentation. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. And you're just actually making the point that, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, I mean, AI will not, of course, replace the urologist, but of course, the urologist that in the future will know and will have knowledge about the use of AI actually could potentially replace those who are not even using it or not having any experience on that. Uh, thank you so much. So um, our next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Nicholas Raisen. Uh, he is a clinical senior lecturer and consultant urological surgeons at King's College of London. And he will talk about the future perspectives uh, and the innovations on artificial intelligence in urology. Uh, Nicholas, stage is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction. Let me just get my slides up. So, as we were saying, what I'd like to take a, a few moments to do is talk about a little bit about what we can expect in the future in terms of how the AI is going to develop further and some of the challenges um, that we're going to face and some of the hurdles that we're going to have to overcome in order to fully explore the, the opportunities that AI uh, has to offer. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. So very briefly in this talk, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about AI and surgical training. I'm going to talk about the role of data science in the AI, looking at causal AI specifically, and then at the end, fitting on the role of our patients and the general public in um, formulating and, uh, or, and supporting the further development of AI. So AI and surgical assessment, um, this has been really one of the key areas um, that AI has been used for, certainly in terms of surgery, the surgical training, um, and it's really remained at the forefront of that for a number of reasons. Surgical training, first of all, gives you a relatively uh, lower risk. I'm not going to say low risk, but lower risk environment in order for these new algorithms and these new models to be tested. There's also a relatively larger or relatively higher degree of standardization in terms of possible data, um, which again has made model easing, building slightly easier. Nonetheless, I don't want to do down what has been done in terms of AI and surgery, surgical assessment. There's been some huge developments, tasks ranging from very basic uh, peg transfer tasks to radical re uh, robotic prostatectomy have all been uh, demonstrated to be uh, applicable to AI and a variety of tasks. We've also been able to utilize a number of data sources, as we heard previously, about uh, learned or unlearned data sources, whether it requires manual annotation, which of course brings with it the necessary experts in order to uh, label that data themselves as opposed to uh, using events data as outputs for uh, our training models. And the achievements of this have been quite substantial. Um, a number of uh, various different AI models have been shown to have very high degrees of accuracy and able to predict performance to a high degree. Um, although it should always be remembered that in a lot of the cases, in fact, the outcomes are relatively specific. And so when we're thinking of outcomes, it may be in terms of differentiating an expert from another surgeon. And as we develop AI for the future, we need to think about how we're going to build this into practice. These considerations are very important. AI has also been able to make very clinically relevant outcomes as well. Uh, some incredible work by Andrew Hung um, on uh, the outcomes in following robot radical uh, prostatectomy in terms of continents and the ability of AI to predict outcomes on, from a clinical basis um, has been really quite fantastic. Um, been able to do that to a very high degree and also been able to show some very interesting insights. For example, uh, in their paper, they will find that in uh, the T3 tumors, in fact, the use of the contralateral hand becomes more important, something that will only be discovered through these novel mechanisms of AI. But really looking to the future, how is AI going to further uh, improve or increase in the role of surgical training? One of the major things is going to be computer vision or is computer vision, as we heard before. So this is the ability for uh, computer systems to be able to recognize and process image data, both static images and also video images, and building this into training models in order to be able to uh, provide augmented uh, decision-making aids to surgeons, trying to show where uh, surgeons can or cannot cut um, is going to be critically important. Improving training is going to be very important in terms of being able to prove feedback. One of the key outputs that's being generated from uh, AI models currently is improving the output of feedback in order to be able to uh, support training and help trainees and surgeons have an increasingly personalized approach to training. 
um, something that AI is going to be able to do. And then finally, a very important aspect is going to be of performance assessment. As speaking before, at the moment, we have very high degrees of accuracy in certain situations and in certain settings for certain tasks. What's going to be extremely important in the future is going to make these outcomes more generalizable and also improve the granularity in terms of our um, assessment in order to make that really useful. So looking at that difference between the formative assessments where it's just helping surgeons improve their skill versus the summers, summative assessments where you're trying to make a decision about the uh, performance um, which of course is going to be very much more important and of course alongside this validation is also going to be critical. Moving on to uh, the next subject, data is uh, an incredibly important topic, data is king and is going to be a driver not only in um, artificial intelligence but in the numerous other areas in healthcare but focusing on artificial intelligence alone. Um, we really, I think the COVID-19 crisis, uh, as awful as it was and the huge burden that it's placed on the world, one of the things that has shown is the ability of using and harnessing AI for our benefit, looking at the range of various applications that have come out, uh, people tracking, disease tracking, uh, new disease or new treatments as a result of AI. And really, this has only been possible building on the effective utilization of data. In this regard, in this comparison, surgery is somewhat lagging behind and really up to date. Up to now, we've been focusing on the low lying fruits in terms of our data usage. We've been focused on data that is generally quite digitized, generally quite structured and repeatable. For example, image data, the, uh, the fantastic talk that Professor Ahmed has just given us on uh, the AI and imaging. One of the reasons why AI has been used so much in imaging is that it has a very usable data set. But what we need to move on now as surgeons is moving on to other areas where that data is not so readily available. And one of the challenges for us is going to be creating and developing that, that those data sets. So what we really need to look at is how we can digitize our environment. Although uh, electronic patient records are becoming increasingly ubiquitous in our hospitals, nonetheless, a large amount of our work still uh, focuses around non-digital data. We may be writing things down, paper operating notes, but also other sorts of information. If you think around the hospital, a normal consultation, you'll speak to the patient, you'll be looking at some images on a CT scan, you'll know a little bit about the patient's history. You may remember a vaguely remember a webinar from a couple of weeks ago about a disease, putting all of this together. What AI needs to try to do is recreate that process. And the way it's going to be able to do that is being able to take as much data as possible and the only way we're going to achieve this is through larger digitalization. We need to be able to look at our data systems. Again, currently, we're largely the data systems are generally in silos. We have different areas of knowledge that we use. We need to make sure that these work much closely together. And also, the, of course, the other important aspect is going to be the regulation. So both in terms of using uh, so patients' data, um, anonymized data, how the uh, regulatory bodies work in relation with uh, healthcare authorities, with healthcare researchers, and also with industry to ensure that whilst we keep data safe, it's also available and accessible to researchers and clinicians. In terms of the future of data science, as I was saying, what we need to do is we need to try to broaden our abilities to collect data. So we're looking at how we can collect data from ever more complex environments. The most complex environment in the hospital is the operating theater. If you consider the different data sources that are available from the anesthetic machines, from the, um, from the uh, radiological data, you have the, from the patient data themselves, the surgeon being able to absorb and uh, process more of this data is going to be incredibly important. Data tends to be multimodal in high dimension. And by what we mean by high dimensional data is when the number of variables of a data set approaches or equals a number of observations. And again, this is highly common in surgery where we have an incredibly complex environments. Being able to harvest that data effectively is going to be extremely important. Another very important aspect of this is going to this is device interoperability. So this is the uh, ability of different devices to be able to communicate together, share data together and use that data effectively. And again, being able to build uh, data science in the future, being able to use healthcare data effectively, we need to build and develop devices that are able to communicate together. We also need to look at our novel data sources, for example, in the operating room, can we uh, capture 
the interactions between the surgeons and the patients, the interactions between the surgeons and the other colleagues, as well as all the other data that is going on from the anesthetic machines, from the preoperative data, from the radiological data, capturing all of this together, being able to use that to uh, effectively model, and also looking at better use of raw image data, so without the need to label um, through that. And finally, of course, um, the degrees of bias and error are incredibly important. One of the key ways of trying to reduce bias and reduce error is going to be in trying to improve our data sets. We also need to be very cognizant of the, the dangers of having errors in our data sets, trying to avoid that as much as possible. The next topic that I'd like to speak about is that of causal AI. A little bit before we do, as you've been hearing, there's been saying, so we've been able to achieve as um, healthcare professionals, as academics, a huge advantages as an AI to date in terms of imaging, as we've heard from Professor Ahmed. AI now is able to predict risk factors, disease progression, treatment responses. So we've done some incredible things. It's um, also almost superhuman, the abilities that AI has been able to have. However, the data science or the data sources and the AI that we use still remain relatively rudimentary. Despite all of these achievements, what we still use is largely observational data. And all we're really looking at, despite all our achievements, is the associations between different variables. So we uh, cannot distinguish between cause and correlation. So we're not sure if X causes Y, uh, or if they're simply both correlated together. And so the major next step in terms of the further development of AI is the development of this process of causal AI. And this is essentially assigning causal explanations to data. So not only will we say both X and Y occur after this date, we'll be able to say that, as I say, X causes Y. And this is going to enable us to take the next great step in able to use AI, not only to look at associations, but also to look at treatment decisions. What will I do? What will happen if I choose to operate on this patient? And for this, we need to be able to have more data and the algorithms themselves. The critical thing was we need to be able to have the counterfactual. So we have the factual data at the moment. So we know from our huge data sets that if we perform a radical prostatectomy in uh, 100 men, uh, a certain proportion of those men are going to um, be cured of their cancer, a certain portion of those men are going to um, relapse, and a certain portion of those men are going to die from prostate, prostate cancer. What we need to know also is what is the opposite? What is it going to happen to the 100 men if we don't operate on them? And in order to be able to make a treatment decision, it's looking at that gap between the two. What is the difference between the factual and the counterfactual? And this is really the essence and the, uh, the key to causal AI, and will really allow us then to explore far more greater environments in terms of using AI. As I was saying, in order to be able to do this, one of the major aspects is improving our data sets, being able to use multimodal high-dimensional data, being able to use temporal data so we know over time what happened to our patients and also be able to generalize our outcomes. And finally, one of the key areas, which in fact is not technological at all, and I feel one of the really core areas that we need to have uh, major focus on is how we involve the pay our patients and the public in the further developments of AI. As we've heard from these talks, there's been incredible developments. AI appears to be racing ahead. Technology progresses ever further. What we need to make sure is that we take our patients with us. We need to be sure that patients understand what it means for AI, what it means for autonomous, autonomous systems, systems to be involved in their care. What even does it mean to have a robotic surgeon? We also need to look at data itself. So how is data collected? How is data shared? How is data stored? Who has ownership of that data? How do we then also work with our academic and industry partners in sharing data effectively? We know that the great benefit of data, we know from the great companies, Meta, Google, the incredible importance of data. So we need to be very aware that data is an incredibly important asset. Of course, it's also going to be incredibly important in developing in the future, as we've heard in the previous few slides about the importance of data science, but how we manage that data is going to be incredibly important. And also the role of bias in data sets, particularly in terms of patients. If we're ever more reliant on uh, AI models, we need to be very clear about the risks of bias and try to minimize those as possible and educate our patients. 
So we need to be sure that we have good strategies for um, educating and uh, informing our patients. There's already a number of different areas on the way, such as in Europe, there's a, the European Centre for Algorithmic Transparency focused on public uh, awareness. There's the Responsible AI um, project, which has recently started in the UK, a multi-million pound project, which again is focused on ensuring that uh, the technology advances with AI and machine learning remain on stand for the public, that public remains involved in that process and they have an understanding of what has happened to them, particular things such as AI and human interaction, transparency, data security, people are becoming ever more concerned about how their data is used. Many studies have shown that GPA patients are generally very happy to share their data with uh, physicians and with researchers if we can help for them, but that concern about losing data to companies, losing data uh, is incredibly important to patients. We need to and then ensure that we have trust in our AI systems and so that when we use them with our patients, our patients are happy for that to be done. And then also we need to ensure that marginal groups are involved as well, and such as in we've already found in AI that marginal groups can be disadvantaged and biased in uh, AI systems if they're not uh, included in the data used to train systems. We need to make sure that we have patient involvement from all different patient groups, so to ensure that this risk of bias is reduced. We also need to make sure that we engage and collaborate, and particularly this is going to be a problem in low and middle income countries where there's resources for the major um, projects that may not be there. So in conclusion, as we've heard for the project or the various talks over this evening, um, I think there's always been huge developments and incredible progress in AI and surgery. Uh, there's also great potential for this in the future, but we need to make sure that we harness that effectively. We have the correct systems in place. We have the correct collaborations between cl uh, clinicians, academics, industry, and then also our patients and the public. Many thanks and uh, any questions, please. Thank you, Nicholas, for your excellent presentation and to, for, guiding, uh, for guiding us through the potentialities and possible pitfalls of what we could potentially call a urology 2.0. Uh, we will um, uh, answer to the question uh, to the questions at the end. So um, let me uh, you all introduce uh, the uh, next speaker uh, is Professor Gozen. Uh, he is the uh, co-chair of this section and the ISU chairman, professor of urology and and the head of the uh, robotic center and Medius uh, clinic in uh, at the University of Tubingen. Uh, uh, Professor Gozen will uh, talk about the ethical considerations uh, in the IDE adoptions in urology. Uh, Ali, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Joe. Maybe after this, all these exciting talks, then my talk will be a little bit boring, but you have to keep in mind, this is the, maybe the most important part when we are going to, going to deal with the artificial intelligence. It's an ethical ethical reasons will rise and then if you will not be able to control it this will if this will be done no more ethical no more control it, no more guidelines followed then you will come in a very diff a very difficult situation and this will be not really no more controllable so we have to take care what these are the ethics in the in the uh, artificial intelligence and then the adoption in the urology i have no conflict of interest it's what is the what is the ethics we are using the words a lot of a lot of times it's nice to speak out but at the end ethics is a branch of philosophy this is involving the concept of right or wrong behavior so we are we have to take to uh, take care that it will be a right behavior and the at the ethics and artificial intelligence in urology this is covering the ethical considerations and implications of the integrating artificial intelligence in the, into the field of the urology. What are there? Just before I want to introduce you a very, uh, my favorite writer, as I was a child, I was reading the books with a great interest and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we can remember him nowadays one more time. He cons considered first time the ethics in 1950s in his book, I, Robot, Isaac Asimov. 
I have written the foundation Stardust. It was for me as I was as I was in school. Is at times I left this world and then go in an, another world. I think now we are we are living in this world. At the end, he proposed three laws of robotics to govern artificial intelligence systems. Very simple. The three laws of the of the uh, of the handbook of robotics. The first law is a robot may not injure a human being or do the inaction allow a human being to come to harm. It's very nice. We have seen this in every every science fiction film. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is this is like a this is like a dream. This is this good that we can start with the Isaac Asimov uh, camera. And it's very, just the laws of the robotics. It just I mean the ethic of the robotics. It means actually nowadays you can adapt it directly for the artificial intelligence. First law, I, it, I already introduced it. This is a robot may not injure a human being. Second law, a robot must obey. It means that if you are using the artificial intelligence, the system or machine learning, what we have given to the system according to the according to the the, the uh, algorithm, it has to work for the human being. And the third law, if a robot must protect its own existence. This is I, I found it very nice. But the second second sentence is covering then the next part, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Maybe this is the critical sentence what Isaac Asimov has met in 1950s. But nowadays, the things are a little bit different. We are better organized, but artificial intelligence to control this field is getting more and more difficult. But we are, uh, we are, uh, we are not working on it. And as you can see, Sorry, this is the yes. As you see, you see, the world's largest technological professional organization, the Institute of Electrical and then Electronics Engineers, launches the guidelines of the ethical uh, aligned designed uh, designed frame uh, designed rules. This these are the, the eight general principles, which are then very 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 important. When you are full of this, this human rights, well-being, data agency, effectiveness, transparency, accountability, and then awareness of misuse. If we will go then just to explain or take a look, what are these ethical considerations? We have to start with the, with the four, four important ones. Just before, it was a, it was a review at an edis, which is uh, reviewing then the article reviewing the ethics of guidelines, they have found then in this in this paper and eleven principles. As you can see here, when you are applying or working or developing the artificial intelligence systems, this these eleven parts are very very important parts. You have to follow it. You at least you have to take care that this this will be then followed by the developers when you are using it or the system. If the system is not following this. The system can bring you in a very, very wrong way or in a difficult situation. Let's think a system is artificial intelligence system is then telling you that this the what is the next therapy option for you. Then the system is actually, let's say, not trustable system is not fair system. Then bringing you every time to a, to a path where you, you have to take for chemotherapy. Let's say, it, this kind of systems can be also very dangerous for our patients if they don't know and then they are just going and asking the systems for their therapy options. Let's start with the transparency. It means then being open and honest. This, the systems, the artificial intelligence system should be explainable and then provide details or reasons for their functioning, making it clear and easy to understand for the intended audience. It means when you are going and using something, you have to know what is the details, how it's working, how is the function, or what is what is the intention? At the end, if you know it, you will trust the system. But there, these are the guidelines to follow in the system. In the urology, actually, the understanding and explaining the reasoning behind the artificial intelligence generated recommendations and decisions are really very important for ensuring trust and accountability in the medical field. Somebody has to take it in account, so it has to be responsible for it. So 
its system has to be open and transparent. So these are the one of the main ethical, ethical considerations. The second one is privacy, the data. We are putting a lot of data. This data is not our data. These are the, the data belongs to our patients. You can just get the permission to use this data in such a system or when you are going to study, even you are going to use any age of the patient. You need the permission of the patient. It means this large amount of data, it has to be protected because the privacy is the most important thing. If these individuals are giving you the permission to use it, even for the scientific reasons, it's a very critical point. It has to be documented when you are going in the studies like we are doing always. The, this personal information has to be handled and securely and in accordance with the relevant regulations. It means you get it, you cannot do, if even if you get a permission, you cannot do with this information or data of the patient, whatever you think it's correct. This is actually the important part we have to know because we are dealing with the data of our patients. So we have to respect the privacy. Accountability and responsibility. Who is responsible for the, for example, chat GPT giving you a wrong information, you are doing something and then you will be, you will get a negative effect at the end. Who is responsible for it? This is an this is actually at the end. These systems should be designed to be accountable for their actions and decisions. The system, when you are asking something using the system, and then they are giving you an advice and guiding you for a therapy. Somebody has to be actually responsible for it. This is including mo mostly being able to identify and address biases or unfairness in the algorithms and then ensuring that the outcomes of the artificial intelligence systems are fair and unbiased. This is actually the most important part or problem. I will just introduce you also challenges, uh, what we're experiencing when we are going to work with the, uh, with the ethical rules and with artificial intelligence. This has to be fair and unbiased. In the urology, it's if, we, if I have to give an example, it's important to ensure that the systems are accountable for the recommendations and then that they do introduce biases or they do not introduce biases or discrimination. It means if you get an information, somebody has to be, has to be responsible for it. This actually, we have one of the important things, machine learning algorithms, they are creating an illustration where is the, where the actor of the algorithm is not capable to predicting the future of machine behavior. The system is working. And then you put the data, you have developed it. And then you cannot help morally responsible or liable for it. It means you have developed it. The system is not working anymore like you have developed. It's possible, we have seen it, but currently it's, really no legal solution for this gap. We have some data protection guidelines, but it applying these guidelines and controlling, it's a big problem when we are working with the artificial intelligence systems or programs. Bias and fairness. There are actually two significant principles of the artificial intelligence ethics. It's essential to develop and assist when you're developing the system. It has to be then unbiased and fair and do not discriminate against any particular group based on factors that race, gender, or socioeconomic status. It has to be fair against everybody. We, this, this has to be then ensured with every artificial intelligence system or when you are developing an algorithm and, and putting the data in machine learning systems. But you have to take care. It's all about the money. This, this applications that could change the healthcare, as you can see here, is everything is going for the billions. Cameron has already presented the diagnostic part. Actually, currently, it's almost the system is one, two mil, billions in, in, the, in the, this, the market price. But we are expecting this only diagnostic part with the artificial intelligence working has to be done in the in five years has to be done six six times more than with the you can if you can imagine this amount of money and if money in a game this game is more or less 
has to be dirty and we have to take care for it. So money is dangerous, just go and see what are the challenges. We know the rules, we put the rules, we put the guidelines, but it's really not easy to, to implant it or to control the systems. As you see, if it's a, it's a lack of ethical knowledge or the watch principles, technical understanding is lacking. If this, this all points here, that's lacking or not possible and not working, this, in, this, in this points, it's difficult to apply the ethics in the system or expecting this also. So we have to solve first these problems to, to able to work when to work with the ethical high quality artificial intelligence system or the programs. At the end, the urology and artificial intelligence and then this ethics are is actually four points are the most important: transparency, privacy, accountability, and fairness. And it needs a careful consideration of the potential ethical impl impl implications and challenges associated with these technologies. And we have to ensure that the artificial intelligence systems are designed and used in a responsible and accountable manner. So actually the guidelines is not uh, really still not effective and then cannot be adopted in, in the practice. Then the most important challenge is lack of the lack of the ethical knowledge. Then we have to start maybe to work at this point and then the controlling and designing of the systems according the right ethics will be more easy. Then I want to welcome you in the fair world of artificial intelligence. Thank you very much one more time for joining us for this webinar. And then I hope you have enjoyed. We have selected topics and then our speakers. We will take some more, some more minutes for answering the questions Gio, can you please take care? Uh, yes, so uh, um, uh, Dr. Gosen, thank you so much for, uh, uh, Ali, thank you so much for uh, your uh, excellent presentation on uh, the ethical use of AI. I just want to mention that um, our team has just uh, uh, published a, a publication that is summarizing actually what uh, Ali just uh, put together in uh, one piece that will be published in Nature Urology Review and will be released by this week. Um, so actually, we have already uh, answered to all the questions, Ali. Uh, so in because the checkbox, have you seen? Yes, uh, we saw the checkbox and everything uh, was answered. Uh, and the majority actually of the questions were on uh, how we can use uh, AI. Um, and basically, if AI actually is only like an academic, pure academic exercise, or that could potentially be used uh, in our daily practice. Uh, just summarizing what uh, our excellent speaker says and also the answers that they put together, I would just say that um, as long as the development is gonna be done uh, together and in joint venture between engineers, patient advocacy representatives, together with AI developers and the urologists, of course, they will bring uh, AI to the next level and uh, having AI in our daily practice. There are uh, uh, already some few uh, features as uh, uh, Karen was uh, was showing uh, regarding the imaging, which actually is one of the most active arena uh, together with the um, pathology. And where, uh, um, for example, some scanners now are able to integrate uh, the artificial intelligence for the detection and for the counting of the cells, for example, uh, reducing, of course, uh, the human error um, and uh, again, uh, all the ethical aspects on that, uh, you know, of course, require uh, regulations. And even though, of course, uh, uh, as you were saying, industries are uh, always around the corner, uh, we need to uh, make sure that everything is going to be done uh, uh, kosher and in a countable way. Yeah. Thank you very much. One more, one more question yes. was there I would like to highlight here. Is about the collaboration uh, uh, between the medical uh, biomedical engineers and um, uh, clinicians. I think Nick's answered it very well. So, but I think this collaboration is crucial here, specifically um, uh, to take it further. With called biomedical engineers, without them, I don't think we'll be able to do much around within the specifically the uh, uh, the medical sciences field when the new when the innovations are there. 
I think without them, it'll be really, really difficult. I think there should be more and more collaboration. And I think we should think about hiring or including them uh, within our team if we are working on specifically on any of the AI projects. I think Nick's uh, answered very well here. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, unless you are like Peter, uh, since Peter yes. is an engineer and a urologist. So in that way, actually, it's the, it's the best way. You have both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can have both actually. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations to Alexander Motri for uh, making a real deal there. You're too kind, you. <laughs> All right. And uh, any? I think we have still some time. Ten minutes time, Sophie. Have you time? It's actually we have still time. It's maybe it's just, uh, some more questions for the for the Peter, for example. We have talked about the huge data. Then how much data do we need them for training such computer vision algorithms? How much data? We are talking too much, too much, too much. How much? Yes, it's a very relevant uh, question. I was thinking the same thing while while Nicholas was speaking on uh, data sets. So we always have a problem in surgery if we want to do autumn, uh, if we want to do surgical assistance. All data sets are too small, and one of the largest data sets is only eighty procedures. And engineers tend to make it happen and to tend to make it work with uh, eighty procedures of gallbladders. But first, the first thing I want to highlight is that as urologists, if you really want to do things with automated assistance in radiology, in uh, surgery, whatever, we should start by recording and accessing the data. In our case, uh, we recently published uh, an addition to to augmented reality with instrument detection, and we needed fifteen thousand images of partial nephrectomies in which every instrument was annotated. So this takes a lot of time, but it's not urologists only who should do it. Um, and in the, in, the, in the questions there in the, in the chat, I also posted the link if people want to start by doing this type of research, how they, how they might do it and, and, and how we at least did it, because it's not only the experts or the urologists, but this can also be done by laymen. Not, not only doctors or urologists know what they see in an image. If laymen are very well instructed, they can learn to annotate or to, to, to see things. Peter, human can learn, machine can learn, why human cannot learn? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want also to, uh, to, to echo what uh, Peter just said regarding uh, the, uh, you know, the type of, uh, of data. And uh, one of the things, one of the key aspects that we have to consider, uh, not only in the development, but also in the training of the model, is that when uh, uh, you are, sorry, not only in the training, but also in the validation of the model, when you are validating a model, uh, it's always better to use the same, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, big data and the, the database that you are available. For example, very recently, the EAU together with Amazon, uh, they put together these uh, radiomic, uh, the, um, uh, um, the uh, PKI challenge uh, for uh, the evaluation of different machine learning is using the same uh, data set technology. That is the way to go. Uh, if you want to compare different uh, machine learning methodologies, actually you should use the same uh, uh, data set in order basically for have a ground through that you can actually use for uh, making the comparison. Regarding also the, the, the question that you make, which actually is uh, like, uh, uh, you could potentially find the, the, uh, the grail, the, the sacred grail, the sun grail, of uh, uh, you know AI is in on uh, how much data we need. Well, actually, this uh, not only depends on the uh, how much sophisticated is the uh, machine learning, but also the type of uh, AI algorithm that you're using. For example, very recently here in California, <coughs> our team uh, um, is uh, has developed the green learning methodology. Green learning is basically a machine learning methodology that is using less. Uh, um, you know, a, a reduced number of uh, items that you need for training the model for having a very similar performance of a deep learning. Uh, and of course, these uh, uh, automatically reduce also the carbon footprint of uh, the artificial intelligence, which actually is something that we need to, you know, uh, think about. Uh, yeah. as, you know, as long as all these uh, uh, information, these data uh, are uh, I think that was, uh, no, I think that I was like uh, frozen, but you know, as, as long as uh, uh, all these data are gonna, this kind of um, increasing over time, we can expect that then the type of energy and the amount of energy that will be used by to train and running those system will be always, uh, always more. So we need also to consider that as well. 
So Nick, I've got a question. I mean, uh, uh, you mentioned about the assessment using uh, uh, artificial in intelligence, obviously. So, I mean, you want, would like to highlight a bit more. I mean, could they be in future use this kind of methodology to evaluate, um, uh, I mean, trainee surgeon and uh, just uh, independent of uh, having the mentor around or is this something that still will require uh, some kind of input from a mentor? Uh, thank you. I think that's a, a really interesting question because it, it covers quite a lot of the topics um, that we've been talking about. So first of all, simply having good enough systems to be able to do that. And as I was saying in my my talk that um, we've got a lot of systems looking at performance and AI, but the actual performance measures that they're doing, they're very, they tend to be quite regulated environments. So the amount of randomness and uh, noise in terms of the data is limited. In a lot of studies, it's also a limited uh, comparison. So you're looking at expert and novices. The next step is going to be able, and what people have started been doing, such as the guys in UCSF, USC, USC uh, rather, sorry, is um, looking at granularity. So being able to give a bit more detail about performance and so not just are you an expert or a novice, but more specifically about performance. The other important thing though, is not only can a, can a, row or can a system do this, are surgeons gonna listen to that system? And I spoke a little bit about getting patients and public involved and coming with us. Part of that will be us ourselves as well. Would we be happy to be assessed by a, or by a ro robot, especially if that robot says we're not very good? Will we take that or is this something that we need to um, consider further? So there's a couple of hurdles. There's something certainly we can work towards, but we're definitely not there yet. Excellent. Maybe if I can add to that from, from the point of view, from, uh, from our scene, which we, where we train uh, minimal invasive surgeries, uh, minimal invasive surgeons, um, apart from getting granularity, I think this is a very important point. And I think uh, the group in California is really pushing the field there. Uh, what we believe is crucial in when you want to train people is the errors. Actually, a good surgeon does not necessarily, uh, um, well, he knows what he should do in a good way, but more importantly, he knows what he should not, he or she should not do. And you want to prevent the errors. And this is why we focus very strongly on proficiency-based progression as a, as a training methodology. And we look at what our errors define uh, good surgeons from less good surgeons. Because at present, a lot of the, the methodologies or the studies show that they can classify, for instance, experts from novices. But why? What is the clinical useness of use, usefulness of determining that somebody is novice or expert if you don't know why? So I think this is the whole thing, like going into gesture, gesture analysis, going further, one step further into the error analysis. And I think this is probably for surgical education, the, the, next, the next big leap. Yeah, I think uh, for uh, for evaluation for these kind of things, I mean, just talking from medical education background. So I'm thinking from um, the main thing um, about assessment is to provide a constructive feedback. Assessment should not be intimidating. So that's why it's always, always a part of the training. So, I mean, in surgical specialty, especially with the use of artificial intelligence, I think the only aim should be to establish who is a safe surgeon, who should be allowed to do an independence practice, and that's it. There should not be categories of best, intermediate, or something like that. Do you see what I mean? So I think that's what the goal should be about the safety, about the patient safety, and about someone who is able to perform independently. Yeah. I think, uh, Gio, we have yeah, to do just want to echo what we... Maybe everybody can say one sentence. Thank you very much for everybody. Gio, you, please. You have no, to I just want to echo what Cameron and, and Peter just say. That, will, you know, it, is, uh, but we are here not to, to discuss the artificial intelligence. Cameron is totally right. But this is the part, this another the, the topic for another webinar. Maybe Cameron can organize such kind of webinar and we will be able to, to join this webinar. This will Love be that. very nice. This will, be, this, will be another, this will be another important topic, Cameron. And thank you, Ali, for organizing this and inviting all of us. Thank you very much. You are, you are very welcome. I want to thank to everybody. These are the best guys here interested in then producing in their fields. Thank you very much for joining our webinar. Gio, Nick, Peter, Cameron, taking your time. Then I hope the, the, the attendees have, they have also enjoyed this webinar.
then this will be anyway this uh, this has been recorded and will be done you can they can take a look thereafter and we will work on the artificial intelligence and then we will keep on eye how the things are developing and we will support these technologies thank you very much everybody and wish you us wish you a nice night i'm in duty cameron you are also in duty i think yeah <laughs> the others they can go to sleep <laughs> Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 And we have to thank to Sophie and Tim. They all oh, did that. Thank you very the much, School Sophie. Of urology. Thank you. Yeah. Team, really yes. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.